Warning. The following story contains descriptions of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. There is something about a criminal doctor that is especially horrifying. We are conditioned to trust them to heal us, to blindly put our faith in them in a way we do with possibly no one else. We take pills they prescribe without knowing what they are. We even allow them to render us unconscious and cut us open to make us better. This necessary vulnerability creates a dynamic that when exploited by the doctor is both particularly unconscionable and terrifying. This is the case of Dr. H. H. Holmes. Holmes was born Herman Webster Mudgett on May 16, 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire, the third child of Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price, both of whom were descendant from the first English settlers in the area. As an adolescent, Holmes attended Phillips Exeter Academy before graduating high school with honors from Gilmanton Academy when he was 16. Holmes' parents were both devout Methodists. His father was from a farming family, and at times he worked as a farmer, a trader, and a house painter. He was also reportedly a heavy drinker who cruelly mistreated his family. Holmes also faced bullying by classmates due to his outstanding academic capabilities. In one incident, he was forced to stand in front of a human skeleton and put the skeleton's hands on his face in an effort to frighten him. Initially terrified, Holmes later discovered the experience to be intriguing and claimed that it helped him overcome his worries. Holmes subsequently developed an obsession with death as a result of the encounter, and later took up the pastime of dissecting animals. In 1882, Holmes entered the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, and graduated in June 1884 after passing his exams. While enrolled, he worked in the anatomy lab under Professor William James Herdman, then the chief anatomy instructor and the two were said to have been engaged in facilitating grave robbing to supply medical cadavers. Holmes had apprenticed in New Hampshire under Nam Wright, a noted advocate for human dissection. Years later, when Holmes was suspected of murder and claimed to be nothing but an insurance fraudster, he admitted to using cadavers to defraud life insurance companies several times in college. Holmes moved to Chicago in August 1886, which is when he began using the pseudonym H. H. Holmes. Soon after his arrival, he came across a drugstore at the northwest corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street in the Inglewood section of Chicago. The drugstore's owner, Elizabeth Holton, gave Holmes a job. He proved to be a hard-working employee, eventually buying the store. Contrary to several accounts, Holmes did not kill Dr. E. S. Holton. Holmes purchased an empty lot across the street where construction began in 1887 for a two-story mixed-use building with apartments on the second floor and retail spaces, including a new drugstore on the first. When Holmes declined to pay the architects or the steel company a yet of iron and steel, they took him to court in 1888. In 1892, he added a third floor, telling investors and suppliers he intended to use it as a hotel during the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition. Contemporary accounts report that Holmes built the hotel to lure tourists visiting the exposition in order to kill them and sell their skeletons to nearby medical schools. Although he did have a history of selling stolen cadavers to medical schools, Holmes had acquired these wares through grave robbing rather than murder. Likewise, there is no evidence that Holmes ever murdered exposition goers on the premises. Yellow Press labeled the building as Holmes' murder castle claiming the structure contained secret torture chambers, trap doors, gas chambers, and a basement crematorium. None of these sensationalized claims were true. Other accounts stated that the hotel was made up of over a hundred rooms and laid out like a maze, with doors opening to brick walls, windowless rooms, and dead-end staircases. In reality, the third floor hotel was moderately sized, largely unremarkable and uncompleted due to Holmes' disputes with the builders. It did contain some hidden rooms, but they were used for hiding furniture Holmes bought on credit and did not intend to pay for. Holmes did not kill an alleged castle victim, Miss Kate Durkee, who turned out to be very much alive. In his confession, Holmes' usual murder method was by suffocation of his victims 
including an overdose of chloroform, overexposure to light and gas fumes, trapped in an airless vault to give some examples. Holmes also claimed to have used starvation and burning victims alive in his castle. Holmes' hotel was gutted by a fire started by an unknown arsonist shortly after his arrest, but was largely rebuilt and used as a post office until 1938. Besides his infamous murder castle, Holmes also owned a one-story factory, which he claimed to be used for glass bending. It is unclear if the factory furnace was ever used for this purpose. It was speculated to have been used to destroy incriminating evidence of Holmes' crimes. In early 1893, a 24-year-old one-time actress named Wilhelmina Minnie Williams moved to Chicago. Holmes claimed to have met her in an employment office, though it is believed that he had actually met her in Boston several years earlier, while he was then going by the alias Harry Gordon. Holmes offered her a job at the hotel as his personal stenographer, and she accepted. Holmes persuaded Williams to transfer the deed to her property in Fort Worth, Texas, to a man named Alexander Bond, which was an alias of Holmes. In April 1893, Williams transferred the deed with the home serving as the notary. Holmes later signed the deed over to Patizel, giving him the alias Benton T. Lyman. The following month, Holmes and Williams, presenting themselves as husband and wife, rented an apartment in Chicago's Lincoln Park. Minnie's younger sister, 18-year-old Anna Nanny Williams, came to visit, and on July 5, 1893, she wrote to her aunt that she had planned to accompany Brother Harry to Europe. In it, she signed off with the message, quote, Brother Harry Holmes says you need never trouble any more about me, financially or otherwise. He and sister will see to me. I hope our hard days are over, unquote. Neither Minnie or Nanny were ever seen alive again, and Holmes would subsequently use Minnie's name in future scams. While working on a chemical bank building on Dearborn Street, Holmes met and became close friends with 38-year-old Benjamin Freeland Patizel, a carpenter with a criminal past who was exhibiting in the same building a coal bin he had invented. Holmes used Patizel as his right-hand man for several criminal schemes. A district attorney later described Patizel as Holmes' tool, his creature, unquote. With insurance companies pressing to prosecute him for arson, Holmes left Chicago in July 1894. He reappeared in Fort Worth where he had inherited property from the Williams sisters at the intersection of modern-day Commerce Street and 2nd Street. Here, he once again attempted to build an incomplete structure without paying his suppliers and contractors. In July 1894, Holmes was arrested and briefly jailed for the first time on the charge of selling mortgaged goods in St. Louis, Missouri. He was promptly bailed out, but while in jail, he struck up a conversation with a convicted outlaw named Marion Hedgepith, who was serving a 25-year sentence. Holmes had concocted a plan to swindle an insurance company out of $10,000 by taking out a policy on himself, then faking his death. Holmes promised Hedgepith a $500 commission in exchange for the name of a lawyer who could be trusted, Holmes was directed to a young St. Louis attorney named Jephthah Howe. Howe thought Holmes' scheme was brilliant and agreed to play a part. Nevertheless, Holmes' plan to fake his own death failed when the insurance company became suspicious and refused to pay. Holmes did not press the claim. Instead, he concocted a similar plan with Patizel. Patizel agreed to fake his own death so that his wife could collect on a $10,000 life insurance policy when she was to split with Holmes and Howe. The scheme, which was to take place in Philadelphia, called for Patizel to set himself up as an inventor under the name B.F. Perry and then be killed and disfigured in a lab explosion. Holmes was to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role of Patizel. Instead, Holmes killed Patizel on September 4, 1894 by knocking him unconscious with the chloroform and setting his body on fire with the use of benzene. In his confession, Holmes implied Patizel was still alive after he used the chloroform on him, before he set him on fire. However, forensic evidence presented at Holmes's later trial showed chloroform had been administered after Patizel's death, a fact of which the insurance company was unaware, presumably to stage a suicide to exonerate Holmes should he be charged with murder. Holmes collected the insurance payout on the basis of the genuine Patizel corpse. Holmes then went on to manipulate Patizel's unsuspecting wife, Carrie Alice Canning, into allowing three of her five children to be placed in his custody. The three children who were placed under Holmes's care were 13-year-old Alice Patizel, 9-year-old Nellie Patizel, and 7-year-old Howard Robert Patizel. 
Holmes and the three Patizel children traveled throughout the northeastern United States and into Canada. He simultaneously escorted Carey along a parallel route, all the while using various aliases and lying to Carey concerning her husband's death by claiming Patizel was hiding in London, as well as lying to her about the true whereabouts of her three missing children. In Detroit, just before entering Canada, they were only separated by a few blocks. In an even more audacious move, Holmes was staying at another location with his current wife, who was unaware of the whole affair. Holmes later confessed to murdering Alice and Nellie on October 25, 1894, by forcing them into a large trunk and locking them inside. He drilled a hole in the lid of the trunk and placed one end of a hose through the hole, attaching the other end to a gas line to asphyxiate the girls. Holmes buried their nude bodies in the cellar of his rental house at 16 St. Vincent Street in Toronto. Frank Geyer was a Philadelphia Police Department detective assigned to investigate Holmes and find the three missing children. In June 1894, Geyer began tracing Holmes' steps and found the decomposed bodies of the two Patizel girls in the cellar of the Toronto home. Detective Geyer wrote, quote, The deeper we dug, the more horrible the odor became, and when we reached the depth of three feet, we discovered what appeared to be the bone of the forearm of a human being, unquote. In Toronto, Geyers discovered unsent letters written by the Patizel children that Holmes had kept. This information led to further investigations of the Holmes' Chicago property and ultimately led to Geyer to Indianapolis, where Holmes had rented a home in the Irvington neighborhood. Holmes was reported to have visited a local pharmacy to purchase the drugs which he had used to kill Howard Patizel on October 10, 1894, and a repair shop to sharpen the knives he used to chop up the body after he burned it. The boy's teeth and bone were discovered in the Holmes chimney. Holmes' murder spree finally ended when he was arrested in Boston on November 17, 1894, after being tracked there from Philadelphia by the private Pinkerton National Detective Agency. He was held on an outstanding warrant for horse theft in Texas because the authorities had become more suspicious at this point and Holmes appeared poised to flee the country in the company of his unsuspecting third wife. In July 1895, following the discovery of Alice and Nellie's bodies, Chicago police and reporters began investigating Holmes' building in Inglewood, now locally referred to as the Castle. Although many sensational claims were made, no evidence was found which could have convicted Holmes in Chicago, as there was only very circumstantial physical evidence. The Castle victims, a piece of human bone possibly from Julia Connor, remains of a child possibly Pearl Connor, a burned gold watch chain, and a burned dress buttons apparently belonging to Minnie Williams, a tuft of human female hair found in the chimney flue. Thus Holmes would be tried for the murder of Petizel in Philadelphia which had the clearest case for murder. In October 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Petizel and was found guilty and sentenced to death. By then it was evident Holmes had also murdered three missing Petizel children. Following his conviction, Holmes confessed to 27 murders in Chicago, Indianapolis, and Toronto, and six attempted murders. Holmes was paid $7,500 by the Hearst newspaper in exchange for his confession. While writing his confession in prison, Holmes mentioned how drastically his facial appearance had changed since his imprisonment. On May 7, 1896, Holmes was hanged at Moya Mensing Prison for the murder of Petizel. Under the moment of his death, Holmes remained calm and amiable showing very few signs of fear, anxiety, or depression. Despite this, he asked for his coffin to be contained in concrete and buried 10 feet deep because he was concerned grave robbers would steal his body and use it for dissection. Holmes' neck did not break. He instead strangled to death slowly, twitching for over 15 minutes before being pronounced dead. Upon his execution, Holmes' body was entered in an unmarked grave at Holy Cross Cemetery a Catholic cemetery in the Philadelphia western suburb of Eden, Pennsylvania. On New Year's Eve, 1909, Hedgepith, who had been pardoned for informing on Holmes, was shot and killed by police officer Edward Jaburik during a holdup at a Chicago bar. On March 7, 1914, the Chicago Tribune reported that with the death of Patrick Quillian, the former caretaker of the castle, the mysteries of the Holmes castle would remain unexplained. Quinlan had committed suicide by taking strychnine. His body was found in his bedroom with a note that read, I couldn't sleep. 
Quinlan's surviving relatives claimed that he had been haunted for several months and was suffering from hallucinations. The castle itself was damaged by a fire in August 19, or 1895. The two men were seen entering the back of the building between 9 p.m. About a half hour later, they were seen exiting the building and rapidly running away. Following several explosions, the castle went up in flames. Afterwards, investigators found a half-empty gas can underneath the back steps of the building. The building survived the fire and remained in use until it was torn down in 1938. The site is currently occupied by the Inglewood branch of the United States Postal Service. In 2017, during allegations, Holmes had escaped execution. Holmes's body was exhumed for testing, led by Janet Monge of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Due to his coffin being contained in concrete, his body was found to have not decomposed normally. His clothes were almost perfectly preserved, and his mustache was found to be intact. The body was positively identified by his teeth as being that of Holmes. He was then reburied. For more content, like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Stay tuned for part 5 of my Deranged Doctor series. Thank you.